Hi guys, um, Jess here. Um, I want to talk about my current health situation. Firstly, I have not been diagnosed with uh, Crohn's disease. I have a family history though. My grandmother has it. Supposedly my uncle, her son, I don't know if that's true or not. I, I don't know that, you know, I don't have firsthand knowledge. But anyways, I'm in the bed right now. I've had some increased pain constipation due to the opiates i just ate lunch and my stomach is gargling i hope you guys will hear it it's just been on and off gargling after i ate <laughs> but anyways i want to talk about my story first so i've always had uh rectal bleeding since i was a kid just little pin pricks on the toilet paper, painless, nothing. They, mom had a colonoscopy done and everything for me on in 2003. They found nothing. So last year in the summer of 2021, the rectal bleeding started to pick up and I started experiencing more pain and I dismissed it as stress because I had lost my job due to COVID and, and then uh, the issues with the car and everything uh, that were going on. I was having some car issues that were stressing me out. So I had to, and I was walking a lot too, so I just dismissed it as all of that. So that was in July. Fast forward to April of this year, I said, uh, you know, where, you know, I finally got the car situation under control and, I, you know, this bleeding kept going on. I said, you know, I need to have this looked at. It's a, you know, at this point, it's an inconvenience thing. You know, it, it, it itches, it bothers me down there. I need to have it looked at. So I go over to Noah Huser Family Practice back in, in April. My stomach just, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but it, my stomach's just been gargling. So... In April, I see my my uh, primary care doctor Shelton. They do what's called an anoscopy, so she goes in with the scope and my rectum, and they uh, she says that she can see a hemorrhoid that's bleeding. So she refers me over to GI because I said, "Can we look into getting these removed? Because it's a quality of life issue for me." So they put in a referral to GI. However, when I called to schedule the GI appointment, this is April, they couldn't get me in for a consult with the GI person until August. So in the meantime, the doctors have it, you know, the primary care says, just, just take note of what you're eating and your bowel movements. And so I did that. And I, you know, I have chronic diarrhea here and there. So while waiting for the GI appointment, a month goes by, I have my follow-up with the PCP. And during this time, I start to develop a, dark, a dull, sharp pain in my rectum at the 6 o'clock area. And I told the doctor, and she initially said, well, we can have a colonoscopy done because I told her the history of Crohn's and everything. She says, I don't want to put you through that. So she was totally adamant about not having it done. So I go in in may and i tell them about the pain this time they do another anoscopy dr shelton says yeah we have to do it we need you need a colonoscopy there's inflammation down there so i tell her hey i can't get up with gi they're just backlogged until august so she says let me see what i can do they call gi uh they get me an appointment with Dr. Lukowitz, and Dr. Lukowitz, he's, he's a quack. He should not be practicing medicine. He had his medical degree in 1972, uh, he, and, you know, and it's like it bothers me he doesn't see patients in person. So I had a phone consult with him, telling him what was going on. He gives me Proctifoam. It's like a little spray that you can put up in your rectum for the hemorrhoids and then a Laticane cream. And he says, we'll call Lucy, my scheduler, and set up a colonoscopy appointment. 
So I call them to set up a colonoscopy. They say, we can't get you in until October. So I was like, oh boy. So after going back and forth with them for uh, several several weeks, they say, oh, we can do a cancellation, you know, put you on a cancellation list. Then they call me. And I say, okay. So then they call me and they tell me, oh, we have you in. We can get you in for July. And I said, that's still too far out. I don't know if I'm going to have insurance. I have to go back to work at some point. So I say, well, and I say, can we possibly go to another hospital? And they say, okay, yeah. So they get it. We get it pushed up to July 8th. Okay. So during that time, a month goes by. This is like in May. Like a week late, you know, a week afterwards the pain starts to increase and it gets to the point where I'm in agonizing pain. I'm in and out of the bathtub. It's hard to, you know, have a bowel movement. I'm literally, and at the same time, my primary care was trying to get me in for a CT scan. And I ended up telling them, I said, look at the, and the CT scan, they're out weeks. So, I told the people at Southwest Medical Imaging, I said, look, this is going to be an emergency situation. I am in so much pain. So I go in and I get the CT scan done. And the results, they, they call me at like 4 o'clock. I, I, I came in at like 4 o'clock, had the CT scan. They called me like half an hour later. I didn't get the voicemail. But I got a little concerned when I looked at the results and they, they found an abnormality on the CT scan. They said there was a small air pocket at the 6 o'clock region, you know, where the pain was coming from. But they said there was no fluid buildup or no indication that there was an abscess, but they needed what's called clinical correlation, meaning they needed further examination to determine what that abnormality was. They said either an ultrasound to the pelvis or an MRI. So I ended up trying to get a stat MRI in. They got me in for like the 8th, I think. I can't remember. It was like a few days afterwards. Then I end up going to the emergency room for the pain. I say, you know, because I'm back and forth. GI's telling me and I go in, a GI doctor says, if you're having extreme pain, go to the emergency room. Since I can't get in to see GI, I end up going to my primary care. And I say, look, I need to know if this is something I have to go to the emergency room for. So the doctor does another examination, different doctor. She looks at it and says, you have hemorrhoids, don't go to the emergency room. It's not an emergency. My my family is telling me to go to the emergency room. My friends are telling me to go to the emergency room. The GI office said go to the emergency room. So that's what I end up doing. Um, and meanwhile, they did blood work at the time. My blood work, my white blood cell was 11 point something, which they said was clinically insignificant, but it had gone up since. And then my C-reactive protein was high. So I go in... On the uh, 7th, it was the 5th, the 5th of June, I go into the ER at uh, Scottsdale Honor Health Osborne, and they, they do blood work, they call the GI doctor who's supposed to be doing the colonoscopy, they basically say, there's nothing we could do for you, this is not an emergent situation. You need to just do this outpatient. So I, I was a little frustrated at this point. So two days later, at, at the middle of the night, you know, and this pain has gotten so bad. I'm talking to the patient advocate with the hospitals, who's basically, ha, 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 you know, corporate part of it. We're trying to figure all this out. And, you know, like a day later, I'm up at like 2 o'clock in the morning and I feel the area and it goes. And there's blood and there's pus. So I'm kind of freaking out. And then the pain relieves itself. And I'm like, 
yeah, I think I need to go to the emergency room for this. So I go to the ER, back to the same hospital, Honor Health, Osborne. I and I I say, you know, I'm not bullshitting. So I take the I take the toilet paper with the blood and pus on it in a bag, you know, and I want to show them. I'm like, this is something going on here. So I go down there. They do the blood work and everything, and they say, yeah, you're a little anemic. Your red blood cell count's a little low. Your white blood cell count's high. I think platelets were low. So they said, we're going to admit you to the hospital. And we're going to have a, you know, you're going to have a consult with your GI and then a consult with the colorectal. And you'll have your colonoscopy done here at the hospital. And then they did, they did an MRI. And the MRI said that it was a, interspinctric fistula and that I had mild diverticulosis. I don't really trust these MRIs because the MRIs and the CT scans tell you one thing. When they actually take a peek in there, it's another thing. So, I'm sorry, I'm in pain right now. So, it's like, it's just, whew. So, I go in, I do the bowel prep that was absolutely miserable, being the fact that I just had an abscess that popped. I'm in the hospital, haven't eaten, slept in a couple of days because of the pain. They do the colonoscopy. Fortunately, I don't find cancer or anything. There's no Crohn's. There's no colitis. There's no illitis. They do biopsies and everything. They said bowel prep was adequate. I didn't really have the greatest bowel prep because of the pain I was going through. So they basically said I had a fistula. Basically I had an abscess that had burst and created an internal opening. So then the colorectal surgeon comes in after the colonoscopy because they, you know, she wants to review everything and her, you know, and I see Dr. Hall. And so Dr. Hall tells me here are your options. I can drain this thing, but I don't want to do that because if I drain it, I create an external opening and it will complicate things. So she says, follow up with me in a week and we'll go from there. So I follow up with her in, in a week and she looks at it. She says, yeah, I think we need to do a little daytime surgery. Uh, basically what's called the an examination under anesthesia. So they basically are going to basically want to, they, they go in, they look, and they see what's going on. And that was basically the plan. She said that we're going to go in there and take a look. If it's just the abscess, we're going to drain it. If it's a fistula, we're either going to do what's called the fistulotomy, which is basically where you lay the fistula tract open to allow it to heal. And worst case scenario, they're going to put a, 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 a seton in, which is a rubber band that allows drainage of the fistula tract. So, uh, a few weeks goes by. They schedule the surgery like three weeks out. Literally a couple days before the surgery, I start the pain starts to increase. So I end up going to, I end up reaching out to the surgeon's office and they say, well, we can look at you Friday morning. This was July 7th or it was Thursday. I can't remember what day. It was the 7th because the surgery was the 8th. But they said, we could look at you Friday morning. Or if you, you can't take the pain, go to the emergency room. So I went to the emergency room. I was there for two hours. I couldn't get in. I said, I can't wait any longer. I am in so much pain. I don't know why I'm wasting my time here when the surgeon could look at me. So I signed a little, you know, release and I left. By the time I got to the surgeon's office, it was so embarrassing. Like you could literally see discharge coming through my pants. So the surgeon looks at it and she says, yeah, it looks like you have a fistula. It's created an external opening. So we're still going to do the daytime surgery. So that happens, have the daytime surgery at uh, the Piper Center. They end up doing a, uh, a CETON placement. And this is really, 
I'm not going to go into details about it, but it's really taken a toll on my mental health. You know, I mean, I lost my job, and I've been dealing with car problems, you know, family drama stuff. Won't get into details, but it, it's it's really taken a toll on my life. And short story, put it this way, I was uh, admitted to the ER after the surgery for mental health and suicide monitoring. I'm not going to go into details about it, but I was there for that. Um, so I was there, that was a horrible experience because I had just gotten out of surgery and, you know, they, at this hospital, when you're in that type of position, they have to have a nurse watch you. So that's what happened. However, there was a shift change and I guess there was, they were short staff. So what they did was they took all the mental health people, put them in one room, male to female patients, by the way. And I was in a room with this girl who was drunk, and she was just going on and on and on. He, I could hear from the room next door. And they didn't put us in beds. We were in chairs. And I just had, you know, rectal surgery, and I'm bleeding through my gown, and they don't do nothing for me. So I'm there from, I get out of surgery from 2 o'clock. And it's, you know, basically what happens, they have a mental health person come down and evaluate you, make sure you're not crazy or anything, they clear you. So I was there at like 2, 3 o'clock after the surgery. They kept me there till almost midnight before I even saw a mental health professional. So I got discharged, and that was it. So the GI doctor, and as I said, I feel like he shouldn't be practicing medicine because of his age, the fact that he doesn't see patients in person. He he had told me things that were different from what the surgeon said. He told me that I would have some mild pain and discomfort for three to four weeks. And a month goes by, and I'm just wondering why the hell I'm still in pain. Then I reach out to the surgeon She's not as available. Their office staff are horrible over there. You can't get a hold of nobody. You can't get a hold of anybody at the surgeon's office. Their, their, their office staff suck. Their manager over there literally does everything. And that's sad. I mean, even helps out with exams. So, I ended up calling Dr. Lukowitz and did a phone appointment with, for the pain. I said, okay, I, I, at least I have somebody to talk to you. You know, and so I talked to him over the phone, and he, you know, I tell him what's going on. He says, okay, and he answers all of my questions, you know, the things I say, you know, and he says, well, this thing does take time, yada, yada, yada. So he prescribed me a drug called Ketorolac or Toradol. Basically, it's an anti-inflammatory used for, you know, to help with pain after surgical procedures, but the dude way over prescribed the drug he prescribed uh he wanted me to take five pills every eight hours they were like 10 milligram pills you're not supposed to take more than 40 milligrams a day and he wanted to give me 50 in a dose and, and so the pharmacy flagged it they said uh you can't uh we can't fill this prescription because of the dosage, your insurance, etc., etc., you need to call your GI office. They wanted to make sure I didn't take too many of those pills. So that was the end of Dr. Lukowitz. No more of him. So, like I said, you know, I've had pain with this, ebbs and flows, you know, I was able to function and everything. But this pain has gotten, this is not normal. I, I, Noticed I had an episode of bleeding. It was a little bit more than usual. The blood was in my boxer shorts. I said, I haven't had anything like that since the surgery. It was an emergent amount of blood, but it was just a little bit concerning. Then the following day, it dried up. I started to get this like rope burn type pain when I was walking, and it got worse and worse and worse. And it, it's it's at the point where if I stand for long periods of time or walk, for long, it's excruciating, and it just gets more and more intense the longer that it goes. And I, at this point, there's something wrong. I've got a high threshold for pain, but I have never been through something like this. So, 
and I'm on and I'm right now I'm taking naproxen. I'm taking a thousand milligrams of naproxen every day. I've been doing that for months now. So um and this and the doctor and this and they I was told that's the concern. They said if you have a pain that gets worse or doesn't go away, that's what we need to look out for. So I uh and the surgeon was not happy with me because I was asking all these questions. I just had genuine concerns about things and she was agitated with me. But you know, I I had reached out to my primary care first. I said, I want to do everything possible before I contact the surgeon. So I, I had an appointment with them. They looked at, and one of the things too is like, I felt like this thing was coming out because it, you know, initially you could barely see the little seton, but now it's like, it's sticking out. So I didn't know if it was coming out. So I saw him. They said, there's not really much we can do. You need to go back to your colorectal surgeon. So I went back to the colorectal surgeon they looked at it said oh it looks fine there's nothing wrong with it and they gave me some lattacaine little samples of it's what's called recti cream and i've been using that and it's still not working so this pain has gone on since the 20th and then um what had happened, I was sitting on my heating pad and I, you know, it's like they told me to, I said, if you can't take the pain anymore, go to the emergency room. I was sitting on my heating pad and I went to check for drainage and there was blood. So I called the nurse's hotline with Honor Health and I told them what was going on. And I said, look, my surgeons dismissed this pain. I'm concerned about these things. They said, you need to go to the emergency room. I wouldn't wait on it. You need to go now. So I go to the ER two days ago. I'm seen by a PA. I'm not seen by an actual doctor. I've dealt with this guy before. He's he's a nice guy, but he's never seen. He doesn't even know what a setting is. I have to educate him on it. So he looks at it and he says, we probably just need to do a CT scan to make sure it hasn't reabscessed or anything. So they do a CT scan. They do my blood work. Uh, the C-reactive protein markers were normal. I think I had low sodium. My white blood cell count was at 13.8, which was where it was at when I had the abscess. So they did the CT scan. And they said there were no, there was no abscess, that the uh, ceton was in place. Uh, so they gave and they gave me uh, morphine. And they gave me another dose of Toradol. So they said, and they said, here are your options. They said they could keep me, admit me to the hospital for pain management. Or they could just send me back home. You know, my concern was with opioids. I don't want to be on them for a long period of time. And if there's no end option, like having this thing looked at and treated properly, What's the point of going to the hospital and being in, being on pain meds? So I just went home. And they did give me uh, oxycodone, 5 milligrams uh, to take for 5 days. But the pain has continued to go on. And I posted on the Crohn's disease forum. I, I just, I've been on opiates before for shoulder surgery, other things. And I've never like not gone without having a bowel movement for 3 days. So I called the nurse's hotline again. They told me I should be taking like Miralax. So they said, well, you should just go to, you need to go to the emergency room. You know, you really need to have them admit you to the hospital so that they can look at this a little bit more thoroughly. So they can look at, you know, like they can do it a little. And I told them everything that happened. So I go to the hospital. Uh, so I go to the ER, the same ER. They get me in. They uh, this time I'm seen by another PA. She seems genuinely concerned. I tell her everything. They give me more morphine. She says I'm gonna call the surgeon this time. We have to come up with the plan because I don't know what to do. I'm not a colorectal surgeon. So she calls Doctor Hall. 
you know, however long later she comes back and she says, yeah, this isn't right. You need a second opinion. So she calls another doctor who I'm going to be following up with on Monday. She actually talks to the doctor over the phone. They agree to see me. They once again offer me pain management, but like I said, I don't want to run the risk of getting hooked on opiates. And there has to be some kind of end end game here. So they sent me home. Uh, they told me to take, you know, take as many laxatives as you can to produce that bowel movement. I ate something in the cafeteria because my I haven't eaten. So I did that. So I, as soon as I got home, I took Miralax and then I have like, I think it's called console or I, I don't remember what it was. It's like stool softener tablets. I took two of those and like, you know, an hour later, I finally had a bowel movement. It was like, it was like a little bit of diarrhea, but it wasn't much. It was just like if I, you know, had water in my mouth and spit it out, it really wasn't a whole lot. And I'm concerned about that because it's like it's on fire when I go to the bathroom. And that's one of my concerns is that nobody's looked at this thing on the inside. You know, that's my concern. You know, they could have done what's called they could have done an anoscopy at the hospital. And if they, you know, if she had looked at it inside and said, oh, yeah, it's inflamed, she could have went to Dr. Hall and said, yeah, there's something going on here, Dr. Hall. Instead, you know, they're going off of, oh, there's nothing wrong. But at this point, I don't know what to do. I'm kind of scared of this pain because it's making it hard for me to take care of myself. I'm in bed half the time. I can't stand or sit. You know, I went to the grocery store yesterday morning and I was literally on the pavement on the ground. I, I couldn't. I'm scared, people. I don't know what to do. I don't know if this is Crohn's. I feel like the hospital's missing something here. Uh, I'm scared. Um, tomorrow I'm going to call the surgeon, but I don't know what to do. I, I, what I'm scared of, too, is like I don't want this to get to a point where I have to call 911. But... You know, this is, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just worried and, and I don't know what to do. If anybody can let me know what I should do, that'd be great. I'm worried about, you know, it's like, because it, an applicant says, get a second opinion, go to another medical provider. My concern is, is that, you know, how long is that going to take? I'm like, I'm already dragged this out three weeks. Everybody's backlogged because of COVID. So it's like, how much longer do I have to suffer? You know, versus I'm already an established patient at this hospital. They have my records and everything. You know, I don't want to open up a whole nother can of worms where my health is already compromised. So it's like, what do I do at this point? I don't know, but if anybody can let me know, I just desperately need help at this point. I have a high tolerance for pain, but I've never been through something like this before. So that's the update for now. If anybody can let me know, uh, that would be great. I'm just really scared and worried right now.